All right, if you would turn your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. It's a problem with using technology. Sometimes you get the little swirling circle and you're like, oh, great. Hopefully it's not how this ends. So anyway, so we'll, we'll do the best that we can. Uh, let me try one more thing here. I might get my notes back, Micah, but you might have to control the screen for me. Um, we'll see how it goes. But Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, as we're going to continue our study here, our time here, of, of the 16 verses and, and looking at this. And it doesn't surprise us, or at least it shouldn't surprise us, that we're finally in the book of Revelation. We're at the end. And so we're at the end of our study. We're at the end, really, of the Word of God, really towards the end. And so we've, we've taken our time and looked at this big picture, this overarching picture that is the story of the Bible itself. And it's not surprising, therefore, that we end in heaven, right, and taking a look at that. And yet the process of getting there sometimes can be impossibly hard and difficult. And it's important that we understand that the choices that we make are heavily influenced by what we believe. Polycarp understood that. Polycarp is one of the earliest stories in Fox's Book of Martyrs. In fact, he was born somewhere in 70 or 80 AD and, and lived quite a long life, especially when you go back in that time of, of life. But and yet he had some very difficult things. It is said that he was a direct descendant or, or result of the, the work of the Apostle John. And so he knew the earliest apostles and was discipled by them. And then he himself became kind of a bishop of one of the early churches down, down at that period of time. However, times were changing and the and world was getting hard and rough and difficult for many of those people. And in fact, uh, right before this, this, what I'm about to tell you happened, there was a group of Christians that had been taken down to the arena. I'm assuming by that they mean the Colosseum. But they had been taken down there and they had been slaughtered for their faith. And while the blood was still drying in the sands of the arena, the crowd was crying out for the name of Polycarp to be brought and that he might meet a similar demise. Polycarp, though now here in Rome, has the opportunity to flee but refuses to do so. And he knows they're coming for him. They, he knows they want him. One of his servants was captured, arrested, and then, and then tortured and beaten until he finally gives up the location of where Polycarp happened to be living at that moment of time. And so a dispatch of Roman soldiers goes to his home and knocks on the door and comes into, the, into there to arrest Polycarp and take him to the Colosseum where he will be certainly killed. And what does Polycarp do? He invites them in commands his servants to bring food for these Roman soldiers to eat, and he simply asks and makes one request, let me pray for one hour. And he does. In fact, he prays for two. And he prays for anyone and everyone that he can possibly think of. He prays for the church, and the soldiers simply look and watch and listen as they eat. Listen to this 86-year-old man pray, probably also for them. But a deal is a deal, and so after those two hours are done, he says amen, and he goes with these soldiers, and they go down to the Colosseum there, and he's brought before uh, Philip the Plutarch, I think is who it is there, and he has to give an account for his quote-unquote crimes against the crown, if you were will. And, and, uh, and as he does so, he's, he simply asks this, he goes, swear to Caesar and say, take away the atheists, to which he replied, take away the atheists. You have to understand in that moment of time that feels kind of strange, but to the Romans and really to the rest of the world, Christians were bizarre because they only believed in one God. They were monotheists, one God. For all intents and purposes, they thought, you're basically an atheist. How can you only believe in one God? To believe in one God is to believe almost in no gods. So ultimately what they were asking Polycarp to do was say, take away all the believers, take away all the Christians. But Polycarp, that's not rejecting God. I can say that. So he says that. And he continues then. He says, swear, swear an allegiance to Rome. Refuse Christ or blaspheme Christ. To which Polycarp replies, 86 years I have served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? 
And this conversation continues back and forth for some time in the middle of the Colosseum. Mind you, there are thousands of spectators listening to every word that is being said, and yet he would not turn. They threatened him with beasts. He would not change. They threatened him with being burned alive on the a pier of fire. They would not change. He would not recant. And he says to them, he says, you threaten me with fire, which will burn an hour and is soon quenched. For you are ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment stored up for the ungodly. But why do you delay? Do what you want. The crowd, of course, called for a lion. But his inquisitor refused. It was to be the pyre. And so they led Polycarp over to this pyre, piled high already with sticks ready to be ignited. And the soldiers go to kind of put him on there and nail him on the, 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 the stick, the pole in the middle, so that he couldn't escape. And Polycarp says, don't do that. He says, the one who gives me the ability to endure the fire will give me the strength to remain on the pyre without the security from your nails. And amazingly, the soldiers backed off. Polycarp then asked and was granted permission to pray one last time, which he did briefly. And then they lit the pyre. It is said that the fire sprang up quickly, but it would not touch him. Instead, it spread an arch over and around Polycarp, but would not burn him. And in the end, an executioner actually had to go up blade in hand and stab Polycarp to finish him off. It would, and it is said that a massive amount of blood poured out of him at that moment in time and extinguished the flames. Polycarp is one of millions who were slaughtered and died in terrible circumstances because of his faith. His faith did not keep him from suffering. His faith did not keep him from tragedy or hardship. But it begs the question, what is it that gives men like Polycarp so much hope that they're willing to face terrible and, and horrible situations and circumstances and go and, and, and undergo a terrible demise? And I think the answer to that is really that he had a hope of something far greater that was awaiting him on the other side. See, what we believe now influences how we live as we go through this life. And he understood and believed heaven is on the other side. As I said, we've come to the end. And we're looking at this and we realize it's truly a remarkable end. It's not simply that we close our eyes in death and then there is simply nothingness. It's not simply that we close our eyes in death and now we play a harp and float in the clouds. Truly, heaven is remarkable. Heaven is truly amazing. And we look to that. But we have to believe that. We have to see that from Scripture. It's not enough to just think, like, it'll be better. Because when, it come, when, the, when the chips are down and everything's falling apart, what you really believe starts manifesting itself. And you realize this is no longer something that's just convenient to believe or I hope that this is true. It gets real. So what you believe changes and affects how you live. The hope that you have for tomorrow will absolutely influence how you live today. And that's what we start understanding here in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Let's read them together. Then I saw a new heaven... And a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. What we're first and foremost we're looking at is this concept of a new home in verse 1. A new home. That starts out here with this idea of a new heaven. A new heavens. And if this does feel kind of familiar to you, it should, because we looked at this a little bit when we looked at Isaiah chapter 65, 17 several weeks ago. We really talked about the ideas of a new heaven and a new earth. And it's weird to think about it that way, but as Chuck Mishler says, we actually learn a lot more about the millennium and, and the future in the book of Isaiah than we do really in Daniel or Revelation. It's strange to think about it that way, but it's actually true. Isaiah gives us a lot of information, so we kind of have seen this a little bit. But what we are being told again, and is a good reminder, that heaven will be 
new. And it's being repeated for us that we can see. Like, this isn't just something, a wishful thinking. It's something that runs all throughout Scripture. Heaven will be new. Why does that need to happen? Because that is kind of a strange concept. What's wrong with that? Because I think in one sense, it is kind of been defiled or contaminated, for lack of better words, because of the fallen angels that, are, that have been there. And it's weird to think that God is somehow in proximity to them and in that way, but it's, it's being said here that it will be made new, it will be refreshed, and it needs to be that way. And so it's, that's exactly what will happen. Now, how that all plays into itself and the logic that's behind all that, I don't know. We're very limited on all those details of how that works, but it's the only logical conclusion. But the heaven, heavens will be made new. But that's not the only thing to be being made new here. Earth, the new earth will take place. Now, this one's a lot easier for us. Because we would look around and we realize, yes, the world around us is under a curse. We looked at that long time ago when we were in Genesis. The world in which we live is under a curse. It's very broken. And we instinctively know it should be better. We instinctively wish and long for the time and the days when it is better. We think, how can we fix it? What can we do here? And we struggle sometimes with coming up with really good answers for that. One of the questions that often comes up, both for believers and non-believers alike, is what about suffering and evil? and how it affects individuals. What about that? It comes up a lot of times in atheistic debates that people think, if there is a God, how can there be suffering and evil, and the problem of evil as it's often called? What about those things? And it's interesting for that. However, as an, if, if you happen to be an atheist, you know, like, and you're acknowledging there's a problem of evil and suffering that you can't explain it, at the end of the day, you can be upset with it all you want to, but if we're just the products of random chance and, and chemical processes, the answer to what's wrong with the world is nothing. You don't like it. That, that's fair. You don't like what is. But if there is no God, you've got nothing to complain about. It's just what is. What's interesting, though, I was listening to, um, uh, uh, a, it was actually a YouTube video, I guess, but uh, listening to slash watching a man by the name of Gary Habermas. I don't know a lot about him, but he was defending the resurrection of Christ in kind of this public forum kind of a thing, doing a really good job. And as is typical for me, I always find these kinds of things after. So like after my sermon on the resurrection, I found his, he was like, oh great, that would have been so nice to think about that prior to that, not after, but whatever. But it was interesting, and he was giving this long conversation on this, really defending this from an amazing standpoint. But one of the things he said in there was really, really unique. 70 to 85 percent of religious doubters, and I don't think he means just doubters of the resurrection or even doubters of Christianity, but doubters of religion in general. 70 to 85 percent of them do so for emotional reasons, not intellectual ones. Now, what that means is this, that's, that, that they're questioning things. We'll just say Christianity because it's easier. It's where we're coming from. They question Christianity not because someone has ever given them an argument from intellectually saying it's impossible that Jesus could have been born of a virgin. It's impossible that he could be both man and God. It's impossible for him to rise again from the dead. That's not why they doubt. They doubt because something in life has happened to them, and they imagine there cannot be a God because otherwise then, then you can't explain why this happened to me. It's an emotional argument. They've been hurt by something in this world that's under a curse. That's why they don't like it. And so they don't want there to be a God. The other thing that he said that was also interesting is that he said 19% of atheists, so a different segment, but 19% of atheists are angry at God. Let that sit in for a minute. I don't know if it's similar. I can, okay, a few smiles. There you go. Like, and, so, and it wasn't lost on him because he says, wait a minute. You're mad at someone you don't even think exists. That doesn't make any sense. But 19% of atheists are, <laughs> admit, we're just angry at God. I wouldn't be surprised if that kind of that, that humor, that irony neither, was not lost in some of the atheists. It's like, I can't put that as my answer. I've, I've got to put something else here. But I think that's ultimately what it is. I think a lot of people in those categories, those, those camps, they're just mad at God. There cannot be a God because he allowed this to happen. I'm just mad at him rather than thinking he truly doesn't exist. But I think that's what it tells us, though, at the heart, that there's an awful lot of people in this world that have been hurt living on this world. 
and it's under a curse, and they're upset about it. They're mad at it. They're hurt by it. We realize this world is unbelievably broken. Unbelievably broken. But in the end, God says, I'm going to make all things new. And all of those things that cause so much pain and so much doubt and so much anger, they're going to be gone. We long for that day. So it's the new earth. And then lastly, in this first verse, we have no more seas. This one is just out of place. It is out of place. If you look at this, new heaven, new earth, makes sense. No more seas. What? We recognize that the sea is certainly part of God's creation, and it's under the curse like everything else. So the fact that it's salty is understandable, but it's just water. What does God have against water? Why is it... Why is it included in our verse, but excluded in the new of everything else? Why single it out? It is odd, but it's not unique. I'm going to actually have you turn to Genesis chapter 1. It should be, I don't know if this is even working anymore, but hopefully Mike is keeping up with his here. Um, But turn to Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. It should be on there somewhere, Micah. But Genesis 1, 1 through 2. It says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Notice as God is creating this, probably some of the most familiar verses in all of Scripture, but notice what's there and what's not. God creates the heavens and the earth. Now, when I think of God creating the earth, I'm thinking, okay, the cosmos, everything that's out there, and then there's this big ball of dirt and it's just like Play-Doh. You know when you get Play-Doh you get right out of the can? There's a boom, and it just, it's there. And it's, 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 it's kind of, I mean, it's got the shape of the can, but there's, it's not distinct. It's just a cylinder. It's just there. It's kind of like the earth. But if you were to keep reading in Genesis chapter 1, you would realize that in the very beginning, what you're really seeing is not a big ball of dirt. You're seeing a big ball of water. It's not until God takes and separates the waters from the waters and causes the dry land to kind of emerge out of the middle of it that we actually get what we would think of as dirt or earth. It's really this big ball of water. So the water is singled out even in the beginning, and so we see it there, but now here in this new creation, we don't. It's an interesting theme that goes actually through the pages of Scripture, but sometimes water is just water. It is. But sometimes water also served as a metaphor for chaos, evil even. And that theme runs in Scripture in different places. Even in the Psalms, you can start to see sometimes that water is being portrayed as something metaphorically as a source of evil, source of chaos, source of disaster, source of monsters. There's something unique that's going on there that's different than there. Even here in Genesis 1, as you look at that, you see the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. What is he doing? I think he's demonstrating his mastery over it, his control over it. Later in Daniel, though, we actually see in Revelation, we see actually monsters and evil arising out of the sea. I think it explains for so long why why so many people had a fear of water. Even even you go back a few hundred years, the tales of the sea, and you see the, the giant krakens coming out of the water and things like that. There's a genuine fear of that. And there's also a sense in which we see, and the disciples certainly would have known this, they, they've been on the Sea of Galilee, which is just a big lake, and they see the storms that would come out where things could be so calm, and all of a sudden just, woof, chaos. And certain destruction comes out of the water because a storm comes up from that. They saw that. Even the more modern sailors, they see the raging seas, like, you know, the dirt that we live on and, and, the, and the earth that we walk on here, it, it's not trying to kill us at any given moment. But you go out on the sea and a storm comes up, you're going to change your mind. I think this lauder, the sea is trying to kill us. It's untamable. It's wild. It's chaotic. In many ways, they saw it as evil. What happens in the new creation? There is no more sea. Benjamin Beale, and, or excuse me, Greg Beale and Ben Glad suggested the presence of the sea in the very beginning left open the possibility for corruption, left open the possibility for disaster in the very beginning. I'm not suggesting that God is the author of evil or sin at all. But we can see this in another way, because that might bother you a little bit. But think also about this. When God made the, the original creation, he made the Garden of Eden, and he put two key things in it. What were they? And don't say Adam and Eve. What were they? Two trees. Tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
Is not that tree of knowledge and good and evil the potential for disaster, the potential for evil, the potential for sinfulness? It is there. What do we not have? No more sea. And as far as I know, there's no more tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They don't exist. What does that mean? That not even the potential, not even the potential in God's new good creation exists for us to ever go back to the experience of the Garden of Eden. It cannot be broken. It will not be broken. There's no more sea. Not even the potential exists for this anymore. So there's no worry from that. So from fallen angels in heaven to the sinful choices of man, or even from the evil springing from the chaos of the sea, truly God has made all things new. We have no fear of, of going through all of this heartache and trial and difficulty ever again. When God says, I'm going to make all things new, he means all things, and it will not and cannot be broken. It's a wonderful promise. Truly, heaven so we have a great hope for the future, knowing that this world is going to be remade and be so much better than it is right now. But it's not going to be the only change. There's also going to be something else that's very, very different, a new dynamic, if you will. So Micah, verses 2 and 3, looking at this new Jerusalem. In most of our translations, new is not capitalized, right? It's not capitalized here. But I think it kind of should be. I think it should be almost part of a proper name. And coming from the East Coast, there's a lot of uh, new states and new cities that are out there. So you've got New York as a state. You also have New York, New York, so a state and a city. You have New England. You have New Hampshire. You have uh, um, New Haven, Connecticut. You have all those kinds of things. I think not too far. Isn't there a New Auburn? Isn't that a, that's a thing, right? It's a, it's a place. New Berlin right? That, those are places. New Mexico, you go out further west. You have those kinds of things. Why did they do that? Why did they do that? I think it's probably reflective of the people that settled there. At least some of them. As they're coming there and they're setting up some of these places, these new colonies, they, they, wanted, they, they missed home, right? They might not have liked the circumstances, the situations that they had, but they missed home. They wanted to bring some part of that along with them, and so there's something in common there, and they're coming up here. They're naming a new city. What should we call it? Well, we miss home, so let's call it, right, Haven, but let's, it's new, so it's New Haven. So there's a carryover, and the carryover in part is the people that came from the original one to the new one, so we're, that, that, that's that carryover, and yet there's also a distinction. It's not the same thing. It's not the same one. It's a newer version of that. And I think like here, like, 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 like here in this new Jerusalem, there's going to be a carryover. It was the place of the people of God. However, Jerusalem as a, as a, as a place, um, there's that similarity which, which it will still contain the people of God, and yet there's something very, very fundamentally different. You remember the role that Jerusalem has played throughout the biblical revelation that we see here. Jerusalem and the people of Jerusalem were directly responsible for the crucifixion of Christ. Later on, even, it's still future even for us, when God sends those two witnesses, what do they do to them? They kill them in the streets and celebrate and have a party. In many ways, Jerusalem, the, the earthly Jerusalem, forfeits its stance with God, its relationship with God in, in so many ways, as a city. And yet, it was still always the place of the people of God. And so there's a carryover, and yet there's also a break. It's new, but it's similar. There's still the people of God that will be there. It is, I think, directly the, the, the best idea, the closest understanding to actual being heaven that we have. It's heaven itself. And what do we see it doing according to these verses? It's coming down. Now, you might not be convinced, per se, as a whole, that heaven is just really like this kind of a city that's descending down, like something along the lines of like Chicago or Philadelphia. Like, we're going to see this massive block that's coming down here, and it's going to be that. We want to see heaven as just this big, massive place, like it's its own country, its own world, maybe even better. But the Bible always portrays it much more in the, in the guise and, 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 uh, and language of a city, not a planet. And we see this, and here it is, coming down to rest on earth. And let's look at a few of these verses here. So here's, um, actually, Mike, I think I told you wrong. It should be Ezekiel 37 on there somewhere. Do you see that? 26. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. 
And I will set them in their land and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. Verse 27. My dwelling place shall be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now look at, remember that. Now look at what we have here in Revelation 2 and 3, verses 2 and 3. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. One more verse. Ezekiel 48, verse 35. The circumference of the city shall be 18,000 cubits, and the name of the city from that time on shall be, The Lord is there. We start flipping back and forth between those passages and those places. The Lord is there. I will dwell with men there. Like, there's this similarity. We start to realize this really is a city. This really is a place. And we can see it coming down here in great glory and, and, and splendor. And we see really for the first time that God will dwell with men in a way that he's never done before. Never done before. And it will be awesome to see it coming down. And so here we are seeing on this new earth and literally heaven coming down in as literal a fashion as you can imagine, coming down in glory and splendor and everything else is going on and celebrating, here it comes. And coming down to rest on this new earth. That's what we get to look forward to. What is that, the significance there, this new dwelling? This new dwelling. Verse 3 is actually starting to explain and clarify for us what verse 2 is really talking about. And it is significant. God will dwell with man. That's a new dynamic. That is a new dynamic that's never really quite been true or, or full before. We've had this partially at times, but never, never like this. If you remember, we talked about the, the, back in Genesis, the Garden of Eden was very much in and of itself like a temple. It functioned like a temple. It was the place in which man could meet with God. Remember what happens when Adam and Eve are cast out? What guards the entrance? Remember the cherubim with the flaming swords guarding the presence of God? Nobody has access anymore. What's embroidered on, on the, tent, the, the curtains of the tabernacle? Remember? Cherubim. What's, what's, what was put on the Ark of the Covenant guarding the mercy seat there in the middle? What's on either side with wings covering their faces? Cherubim. They're guarding the presence of God. The temple was always the place in which God was sort of kind of with people. Now there was a, there was a distance there. There were curtains there. There were limitations there so that we not get too close and be destroyed by seeing God. But it was the place where God met with men. That doesn't always exist. The Garden of Eden, of course, they're thrown out. That's no longer accessible. And it's not really accessible until the tabernacle. And then later the temple. And then the temple's destroyed. All those things are going on there. So there's times in which God is near and there's times in which God is far. But the temple was always the place where God could dwell among men. And that's ultimately the greatest loss that we had, especially Adam and Eve had. When they sinned, they lost access to the presence of God. The Bible Project has a video on this. I really, really appreciated it. And, kind of, uh, and you can find it on YouTube very easily if you want to later on. It's an older one, but... They kind of had this idea here that, that heaven and earth always kind of could co-mingle or, or overlap ever so slightly. Kind of like a Venn diagram. Have you ever seen that where they got the circles and they, you, know, you overlap them a little bit so you could have a, a yellow one and a blue one and where they kind of overlap, there's like a little green football in the middle that's, you know, that Venn diagram. And it's kind of like this idea here of earth and heaven and there's a, a place in which they overlap. There's just a little bit of an overlap and for many ways, that was kind of what the temple was. It was a clean space. It was a place that was made clean, really, especially in the tabernacle and in the temple, by the blood sacrifices. There God would dwell in that space because it had been made clean. Right? And then Jesus comes. And the entire time he's on earth, what is he announcing and telling his disciples to announce? The kingdom of God is at hand. And by proclaiming that kingdom, he's telling them a little bit of peace of this has come to you. Right? And then he goes around and, and, and he leaves. And what takes his place? The Spirit of God. Dwelling among men. And all of a sudden we talk about what? Your body is the temple of God. Right? It's a clean space. It's where we dwell. And, and everywhere we go in Christ, there is a little bit of God's temple there. Now that sounds maybe weird to you, but think about this. We are clean. A sacrifice has been made. Blood has been spilled out so that we might be right, made right with God. Right? Do I, have any, do I need to offer another sacrifice? 
never again. Why? Because I've been made clean. I've been made new, right? We see that the Spirit of God is living in me. I am a permanent, clean space because of the work of God in me. Do you see what's going on? Like we are truly, when he talks about the kingdom of God has come, like you're part of that kingdom, the temple there, it's where God dwells. You're part of that kingdom and we're there and we're making these disciples and it continues to spread and go everywhere. And then we look at this final kingdom and we realize that God's no longer going to be living in these confined spaces like you and me or in the temple or the tabernacle or anything like that. The place of God and the place of man will completely overlap. He's everywhere in the sense that everyone has access to God everywhere. Truly heaven on earth, restoring to believers what was the greatest loss from the garden. Access to him. And when you understand that, it makes it so much easier to face those difficult circumstances in life. There are, you can see that in various ways and, and with various people too, because you know, you're familiar maybe with some of the Negro spirituals that were out there that people shared and used and enjoyed for so long. And, and one of the biggest criticisms that have existed about them was that they were like otherworldly. Like, how can you be so happy? Your circumstances in life are awful. How can you be so happy? And that's not a modern criticism uh, by, by people. That's actually one that goes back at least 80 years, if not before that. And a man by the name of Howard Thurman back in 1947 gave a lecture at Harvard talking about this very thing, the fact that Negro spirituals are out of touch with reality. And he said this, What greater tribute could be paid to religious faith in general and to their, speaking of slaves, religious faith in particular than this. It taught a people how to ride high to life, to look squarely in the face of those facts that argue most dramatically against all hope, and to use those facts as raw material out of which they fashioned hope that the environment, with all its cruelty, could not crush. They sang about what they believed. And when they faced harshness, and when they faced difficulty, it didn't break them. And, and we still sing them. And you sing them, and they're still they're upbeat, and they're enjoyable, and they're amazing, considering who's writing them and how they're doing it. And, and some of these, I have some examples that, to remind you of some of the ones that are out there, because it's like, you might not even realize that they're, that's what they were originally, but swing low, sweet chariot. Going to shout all over God's heaven. Nobody knows the trouble I see. He's got the whole world in his hands, and many more, and they're born from that, not as a way to ignore what was going on, but because it would not be crushed by what was going on. So it's not that the slaves there, they were tone deaf to things, or they made them, like, it, it just, they were just like, oh, it is what it is, we're just going to go with it, right? It's fate, this is our lot in life, and whatever. Because that's what I think people sometimes criticize them for. Why didn't you rise up? Why didn't you do something? Because they had a hope of something far greater and more that was coming. And it wasn't going to be simply crushed because they had a white master who hated them. Looking towards the end changes how you view the middle. And they were looking for the end. And that brings us to our third and final point, a new reality in verse 4. And I do realize we have to be quick here. And we've really actually covered this last verse very, very well in Isaiah 65, 17, so we'll be short here. But we are reminded of all the things that make life so hard, that threaten to bring tears or cause us to lose hope. And we realize God's going to wipe those away. And those tears won't come back. And it's hard, it's not hard to wonder how because of the people that we know, the relationships that we have that have been broken or have been wronged or destroyed or, or what, twisted or whatever else. But we understand also that Jesus knows what brings tears. I was thinking about this and we mentioned a couple of these in Sunday school a little bit, but you remember that Jesus, he mourns over Jerusalem. They're rebellious and they're wayward and they won't come. And he mourns over Jerusalem the way a parent would mourn over a child. They won't come. Jesus mourned over the loss of his friend, Lazarus. He knew it was like to bury a very close friend. And yes, he knew he was going to raise him up in just a couple of days or a, little, a few moments. But it doesn't change the fact that that was a real, genuine loss. 
He knew what it was like to do that. He came up in Sunday school. Jesus knew what it meant to bury a parent, probably burying Joseph at some point, his father, his earthly father at least. And Jesus knew what it meant to, to weep and cry over his own impending death, being afraid of what was coming, and to know that it's unavoidable. You have to go forward. There's no going back. You must go forward. Jesus knows what it means to do all, and weep over all those circumstances. But here, it's all done. They're all behind you. And so we look at here a new home, a new dynamic. And those are all pretty amazing things as we think about this. Um, Mary, could you just get Daniel, please? And those are all pretty amazing realities as we think about this. But it changes the way you look at it when you have this eternal perspective. The things aren't always going to be like this. That when you're confronted with cancer, as some of you have been in some capacity, you remember it's not always going to be this way. When you're confronted with a broken relationship with a spouse or a family member, it's not always going to be this way. When you're confronted with your own frailty of life, it's not always going to be this way. When you're confronted with injustice, you're reminded it's not always going to be this way. Millions of believers, from the church fathers to slaves to everyone else, to some of you even sitting in this room, you've gone through and experienced hardship and difficulty. You understand the question when people talk about the problem of evil. You, I know exactly what evil they're talking about, and it is a problem. But you're looking to the end. It's not always going to be like this. God's going to make everything new. And we can look at someone like Polycarp who looked to God and realized better days are ahead. And we look, need to look to God likewise. Realize better days are ahead for those who are in Christ. And it will keep you from getting crushed. And it will keep you from even like, getting too invested in this life and in this world as we are prone to do as Americans because we have so much. Better things are coming. And this is the end that awaits all true believers. And it will truly be glorious. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day that you have given. We thank you for being able to study these 16 verses, these 16 passages, and reflect on this. And what better way to end than on heaven? The reality is that we have, many of us anyway, have suffered terribly in this life from moment to moment. Some, maybe for their faith, have experienced hardship from work or maybe even difficulties from a spouse or something like that because of faith, either the presence or the lack thereof. And yet, Lord, there are other, many other people that have experienced all kinds of things, just the hardness of life. But we are reminded, Lord, to have an eternal perspective. It's not always going to be like this. And we long for the day when it's different. We long for the day when it changes. Lord, help us to be patient and faithful in the meantime, while we wait, looking forward to the new heavens, the new earth, and no more sea. In Christ's name, amen.